I'd like to welcome everyone to the Vasculitis Foundation webinar today. I'm Kathy Olevsky, the host for the Vasculitis Foundation's educational webinar series. I'm also a patient living with MPA vasculitis. Today's presentation is a follow-up question and answer session from a previously recorded webinar on sinuses and vasculitis. These webinars are part of the Vasculitis Foundation's commitment to patient education, and we would like to thank our sponsors, AstraZeneca, Amgen, and Novartis for supporting these webinars. And we're grateful today to have Dr. Brent Sr. with us to answer the questions that we could not get to in the previously recorded webinar about sinuses and vasculitis. Dr. Brent Sr. has served as the Chief of Division Rhinology, Allergy, and Endoscopic Skull-Based Surgery at UNC North Carolina since 2008, where he is also a professor in the school's neurosurgery department. He is the Vice Chairman of Clinical Affairs in the Department of Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, and specializes in endoscopic, minimally invasive management of sinusitis, CSF rhinorrhea, and tumors of the anterior skull base, as well as surgical management of sleep apnea and snoring, which of course makes him an expert for answering all these questions for us. So welcome, Dr. Senior. We're so happy to have you here today. It's a pleasure to be back. And I would wonder if you could give us if you have any disclosures before we get started. Uh, no, I don't have any relevant uh, disclosures to this uh, talk. Okay, great. Well, just so that our uh, viewers are watching, I hope you have watched the previously recorded webinar on sinus, sinuses and vasculitis that Dr. Senior did with us earlier this year. And we had so many questions. He was so generous to give us his time. We're going to start today by asking him some of the questions that we didn't get to in that first webinar. So if it's okay, I'll get us started with the first one, which is about GPA. Uh, my, my GPA led to permanent hearing loss. However, I don't well understand what happened. Are you able to provide some common reasons for this permanent loss? We, we did have quite a few questions about hearing and hearing loss. So uh, it'd be great if you could answer this one and maybe one follow-up one. Yeah, absolutely. So, so GPA and vasculitis in general can absolutely affect hearing, and it can affect it in several ways. The two most common ways that we would see it are uh, a conductive hearing loss, where an individual may experience some fluid developing behind the eardrum uh, in the middle ear space, and that would probably be a result or a cause by inflammation in the eustachian tube. Remember, the eustachian tube travels from the ear, from the middle ear space, to the back of the nose, at the top of the throat and the back of the nose, where the two come together. And GPA can absolutely impact that area. We can see scarring. We can see inflammation in that area where the eustachian tube enters the nose, sinus, and back of the throat. And so if that happens, if there's inflammation back there, the eustachian tube won't be able to ventilate the middle ear space appropriately. There won't be um, uh, drainage essentially uh, of the middle ear space that will be able to occur. And that's going to result in fluid buildup and that can result in chronic infection. It can result in a sensation like you're underwater when you're, when you're uh, speaking. So that's one form of loss of hearing that can occur. And the good news with that one is oftentimes it's reversible. We can, we can um, do either a little ear tube or more recently, there's been some exploration in the idea of um, dilating that eustachian tube and we can restore uh, some of the more normal function to the ear uh, with those uh, types of approaches. The second way you can lose hearing related to GPA is actually damage to the nerve of hearing itself. So that's probably, we believe, related to actual inflammation of blood vessels somehow impacting that nerve of hearing. And that's a little bit more concerning from my standpoint because that's more of a, a permanent hearing loss that can occur. That isn't something that tends to happen overnight. It tends to be something that would just gradually occur over time. Um, and, and and it is something that... Um, could be determined by a hearing test. 
a good audiogram should be able to help us to, to figure that out. Now, it won't tell us necessarily that GPA is, is causing it, but it will tell us if the nerve itself is, is, is damaged and not functioning correctly. And, and so in those cases, oftentimes we uh, rely on hearing aids uh, to help uh, treat those individuals. Okay, well, that kind of answers the follow-up question, which was, is, is, it, is the damage permanent? It depends on which kind it is, according to what you just told us. And I'm guessing that you would recommend that people contact an otolaryngologist and get more information on that so that they know. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you need a good examination of the ear and of the back of the throat, back of the nose. But you also need a, an audiogram. So both of those pieces of information are going to be very important for an otolaryngologist to try to figure this out for you. Okay. And one question that I had is these, uh, the two questions we got were patients with GPA. Are there other forms of vasculitis that you know of that affect hearing or is it mainly just GPA? I'd have to say um, my my most of my experiences with GPA in this regard, um, I would presume that some of the other vasculitides could impact hearing like this, but I can't honestly give a good solid answer on that. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, can you tell us what your thoughts are? This one patient is asking on less invasive balloon sino sinuplasty for vasculitis patients. So balloon sinuplasty is, a, is a, a technique that was developed about 15, 20 years ago now, where literally a little catheter, a balloon catheter, very similar to a catheter that's used for dilating a blood vessel in the heart, an angioplasty in the heart, is actually feathered up into the nose and the sinuses, and it's used to dilate the tract, the drainage tract of uh, a particular sinus cavity. Um, typically, uh, the balloon is used in, in several different sinus passageways on a given side for a patient. The procedure can be done under local anesthesia in the clinic setting, which makes it real desirable for a lot of patients. Um, and, and it has certainly become very popular um, uh, in general in the community for treating sinusitis in a, in a less invasive way than typical endoscopic sinus surgery. That being said, unfortunately, probably has very little application in most patients with vasculitis. Now, it's, that's not an absolute. There are always exceptions. But I would argue that it's probably unlikely, very uncommon that the, that, um, uh, the indication would be there to do that type of treatment for the nose and sinuses um, when vasculitis is present. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure I understand this next question, so maybe um, I'm hoping you have some point of view on it. Is it common for GPA to start in sinusitis, and then that clears up and it moves to other symptoms like joint pain and eye pain, but no sinusitis? Um, I, I would say that it's absolutely possible that it presents in the nose and the sinuses and that the uh, sinuses may, it, the disease may move or migrate a little bit over time. Um, it's probably more likely that the sinusitis has just become very low grade and it's not really super active as if the disease is moving to say the kidneys or the lungs. Um, but I would say it's also possible that the sinuses could improve and that things could settle down and that the kidneys and lungs become more primary. But that would be unusual in my experience. I haven't quite seen that. Usually everything goes kind of hand in hand unless you just have isolated disease in one area or the other. I don't see it sort of moving back and forth around uh, the body like that. Okay, thank you. The next one is actually about ears again. I probably should have caught this earlier, but how can eustachian tube dysfunction present when GPA is the culprit? And is this common? Yeah, this is this gets back to that same same thing that I was pointing out before. Um, 
the eustachian tube again can become very dysfunctional uh, and it can be dysfunctional in, in patients without GPA as well. It's not terribly uncommon problem. Um, but in the setting of GPA, we see a pretty significant dysfunction, again, oftentimes related to actual scar forming in that tube. And when that happens, then you get that conductive hearing loss, and then you have problems uh, uh, that, that need to be dealt with. Again, the good news being that we do have these newer treatments, and potentially the eustachian tube could be dilated and potentially that could help someone with um, a scarring related problem with their hearing. But I gotta say, there's not good data on that. So we don't really know what to expect there. And it may be uh, something that um, maybe some otolaryngologists would be willing to consider. Uh, however, uh, I would say that that's, that wouldn't be super common at this point. We really just don't have good, good data on performing that type of procedure specifically in the setting of GPA. Well, that makes sense. And that relates back to what you said earlier. Um, I just want to remind everyone, this: the questions that are coming came from the previous webinar. So that'll help this one make sense because it says, you say to avoid surgery, but in the presence of invasive polyps in that case, uh, is that the case? I had two surgeries within 12 weeks for severe presentation of polyps. Were, they, were those surgeries potentially avoidable? Probably not. Yeah. So probably what I'm hearing in this particular question is that we've got two processes going on. So what I was referring to is we want to avoid surgery when vasculitis is the root cause of the sinusitis. That's a different process than perhaps what I'm hearing in this situation, where there probably is a separate disease process, nasal polyps, nasal polyps with sinusitis that need to be dealt with separately. So um, every case is individual. Um, I don't want to make a blanket statement. Again, I would emphasize if your vasculitis is causing the sinusitis, then we really do want to try to avoid surgery. Mm -hmm. But again, polyp disease shouldn't be in vasculitis. We don't see typically polyps. Now, that ex the exception there would be EGPA. EGPA absolutely has polyps, and those can be managed um, surgically. But for vasculitis with GPA, then we would say that it would, should not be um, uh, managed surgically. Well, that certainly explains the context of that question. So I appreciate it. Um, the, one of the questions also relates to that. It says, what does a sinus biopsy show if it's, is it, if it's actually positive for vasculitis? Yeah, it's going to be able to be read by our pathologists and show the histologic characteristics that we see with vasculitis. So it'd be very similar in a way to um, doing a biopsy in the lung or a biopsy in the kidney. The, what what your, the pathologist is looking for is they're looking for those changes in the blood vessels, right? And they're looking for the, the granul granulomatous changes that occur in the, um, in the uh, blood vessel itself. And those changes will be manifested in wherever you do the biopsy. Now, that being said, nose and sinus biopsies, for whatever reason, even when there's active disease present, vasculitis present, can oftentimes be negative. So it is a very, uh, I would say, at least 50% of the time, our biopsy will not show the vasculitis. So the yield on biopsying the nose and the sinuses tends to be relatively low compared to biopsying for vasculitis in the lung or biopsying in the kidney. Hmm. Okay. And um, in this next question, I remember you talked in the webinar about nasal irrigation, and this person has a question about it. It says, I use hydropulse nasal irrigation, and I had no relief with the six ounce bottle. And first of all, what's hydropulse? And do you recommend so yeah, yeah. So uh, it's just another way of administering irrigation. It's a battery powered device that actually literally pulses it almost like a water pick in a way. And in fact, people used to recommend water picks actually for nose and sinus irrigation. That's completely okay as well. I, I think that it's really what works well for you and what is tolerable for you. As you can imagine, flushing the nose with a big sinus rinse bottle, that can be a little uncomfortable. Sure, because it's a large volume of fluid and what have you. But certainly hydropulse can be uncomfortable for some people as well. 
all of these things I think are, are reasonable. I don't have any concerns about them. It's really what your body tolerates, what you like personally. But I think the point is doing saline washes is very, very important. How it's done is kind of up to the individual. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I know that we did talk about that in the webinar and how important it was. So I'm glad to hear you um, reiterate that. This next question is, how do you know if the crusting and mucus is normal and not inflammation or residue from the GPA damage? Yeah, it's a great question. And honestly, it's a tough one for us. You know, I can look inside a nose and I sit there thinking and stroking my little fuzzy chin, oftentimes trying to figure that out myself, because it really is very uh, challenging to, when you look at these areas, you, you absolutely can have normal, normal crust form over scar tissue and things like that. So it is a very, it's a very challenging thing. There's no sort of hard way or hard solution for sure solution to, to that, that question. I just have to use my experience and look at it. I'll take cultures sometimes. I'll look all around the areas. I will oftentimes suction away that mucus and that crust to see what the tissue looks like underneath that crust. So, you know, scar tissue has a very certain, has a very uh, typical appearance to it, healthy scar tissue, but then granulation, irritation, if it's inflamed, that makes me think more likely that there's active disease present. So it's, it's not, it's not an easy call, but it is something that someone with experience who's looking at your nose should be able to determine. Okay. Um, the next one, this is also something that we commonly get asked in social media groups and stuff. Once you're diagnosed and mostly under control, how common is it to develop saddle nose? Yeah. So if the disease is under control, then the likelihood of saddle nose, um, if you don't have it already, the likelihood of it developing would be relatively low. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, if you're able to catch the disease early enough and you're able to get the inflammation under control, the inflammation in the nose under control, then the hope would be that you absolutely would not form a saddle nose. And I think the likelihood would be fairly low that that would happen. Now, if the, you know, the, the typical course of the disease is it can wax and wane. And so you do have to stay on top of it because certainly the way it looks today doesn't necessarily tell me the way it's going to look six months from now. So we have to be sure to, to kind of keep that inflammation down, keep the nose as calm as possible to ensure that that doesn't happen to an individual. A saddle nose happens, you know, because there's a, a very specific area of the cartilage that has, has essentially died. So that little area of structure, it's a critical area of structure in the nose that provides the, the, the support for the nasal septum and the nasal dorsum. That area dies away and it just happens to be when that area goes, then that's when the saddle can form. Um, and and uh, so again keep the inflammation under control and you won't get a saddle nose. Well, that's really reassuring for the patients that that's one of their concerns. And again, your message is clear, just consistent care with your doctor mm -hmm. is what's going to help you um, avoid that if that's important to you to keep an eye on. Um, does, does this also affect involvement with the teeth? I mean, can it spread to the mouth or impact to the teeth? Do you know? I, I don't know if that's an appropriate question for you, but it has come up. Yeah. I mean, it's a theoretical risk, right? The, the, the vasculitis can impact the, the, the um, septum and down into the roof of the mouth. Um, the hard palate can be involved. The maxillary sinuses are on the, the cheek sinuses right here. The teeth actually come up into those cheek sinuses. So the, the tooth roots are actually oftentimes sitting in the maxillary sinuses. So absolutely, the teeth can become involved and the hard palate and the, and the uh, um, uh, alveolus where the teeth sit can all be involved with vasculitis. Absolutely. You know, you hear people when they have some sinus pain, they do talk about that actually feeling it in their teeth. So that um, is also an important question to ask. Uh, this next one's interesting. 
Have you ever dealt with a patient who had sinus involvement with vasculitis and they wanted to get a nose ring or a small, a small metal stud or something? Um, and if you have dealt with that, how did you advise them or, or how would you advise someone that wants to get this done, but is living with vasculitis? Yeah. Yeah. It's, in, it's a great question. So vasculitis typically in the nose and sinuses starts out more in the septum. So it's more in the midline and particularly at the front of the nose. That's where I see it. I see it almost exclusively in the midline. So involving the septum in the very front of the nose, it doesn't typically involve this sidewall of the nose. So this part of the nose, just at the front, the, what we call the ala of, or the opening of the nostril right there. And so, you know, for someone who wants to get a nose ring where it's involving the ala, probably I don't see a problem with that. I think it would be completely fine. I think the risk to the individual would be very low. And I don't think there's much uh, a chance of any sort of side effect that way. If, however, you're interested in uh, 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 piercing the front of the nose through the middle, through the columella, might be a little riskier, honestly. Um, and, and remember, too, frankly, I think those are bad ideas anyway, um, because that does potentially, if there were a complication related to that, that piercing, that does impact structure of the nose. And so you could have some serious structural problems if you were to have a problem related to that piercing. Now, because vasculitis, again, starts in the midline, I would be just reticent to recommend anything, any piercing in the columella or in the very middle of the nose in the front of the nose. Well, there you go, everybody. They, he gave you an honest answer. He didn't say no to everything, but he <laughs> advised against some of it. So that was a, I think that was a great answer. Um, I'd also love to just ask you, um, for a patient who is newly diagnosed and has sinus involvement, can you say what you think the most important things are that they need to focus on, keep an eye on moving forward? What, what, what are your messages to them? Maybe two or three things. Well, first of all, make sure you're following with an otolaryngologist. <laughs> I think that's really critical because it's really important that we keep an eye on the nose. And with our scope exams, that we be able to monitor what the disease is and how the disease, disease is acting inside the nose. And then in terms of self-care, irrigations. I just can't say enough about how important those are. Saline irrigations, I tend to uh, like... Um, just isotonic saline, so normal saline irrigations, the same. You'll, you'll see the little packets in the drugstore that, that measure the perfect concentration for your little sinus rinse bottle. And that's what I like. That's what works really, really well. And very commonly, I'm going to recommend some sort of medication be added to that as well. And that's really critical as well. Um, and then finally, I would say if the patient, if an individual is experiencing a change in their nose, that we want to we want to take a look at that relatively quickly. The nose, in my opinion, is very commonly a barometer of the disease in general. So if the nose is starting to act up and giving you trouble, that always makes me concerned that the whole disease process is starting to kick up. So make out to make sure to uh, to be seeking out care, getting seen by your otolaryngologist fairly quickly if you're noticing some changes in the nose and sinuses. Okay, well, those are some great messages for people. We're trying to ask that in our webinars of the doctors. What are your two or three main points that people should keep an eye on? And we appreciate that. So. Uh, thank you so much for taking your time to talk with us today, Dr. Senior. We, we appreciate your time so much, I can't tell you. And those follow-up questions are such a bonus when we can get doctors on here after the webinars because there were so many that were left unanswered. So thank you so much for spending your time with us. It's a pleasure. Happy to do it. And we would like to thank um, the Vasculitis Foundation for hosting these webinars and um, just at, and, and ask our, our sponsors, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Novartis. Of course, thank you to them as well. And thank you, Dr. Senior. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.